here together. After a time of uncertainty and patience, here we are. Together again. Sharing our passion, future, and challenge. Expanding thoughts and perspectives. We face the world together. Here, together, with TCTAP in 2023. And we start now. Get together again at TCTAP 2023. Why don't you give it up for a grand opening? Please give a big round of applause once again. Thank you very much. And to kick off this meeting, let us invite our co-chairperson who helped prepare for our meeting, Dr. Sung Jong Park, to the podium for an opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him with a big hand. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So, on behalf of organizing committee, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 28th annual meeting uh, of TCTAP 2023. Due to outbreak of pandemic, so we were all going through hard times, and so many dramatic changes occurred in our lives. However, we were able to overcome and shift adversity into an opportunity with our new adventure, that is TCTAP virtual. Especially last year's our online meeting turned out to be a huge success, gathering about 7,000 viewers from uh, 87 countries. I believe that this remarkable progress would not have been accomplished without your help. This year, TCTAP will be much more special with a variety of inspiring on-site sessions, including diverse live case demonstration and future lectures and discussion from the top experts to learn about the latest trial updated knowledge. And also a selected series of our program will be live streamed for our online participants. I am looking forward to the next three days journey. I hope you all enjoy uh, sharing the knowledge and build up your new friendships too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Park, for preparing for today while take, partaking in various research to elevate the quality of treatment and, and as curing the safety of patients. Uh, thank you very much once again. And um, Dr. Togu Park has also put in great effort in this meeting as a co-chairperson. So let us uh, welcome him to the podium to have his congratulatory remarks. Please welcome him with a big hand. Yes, so we first invite Dr. Sung Woo Park for his congratulatory remarks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sung Woo Park. I'm 
president of the Korean Society of Cardiology, so I was invited in this meeting. On behalf of Korean Society of Cardiology, I'm very proud of TCTAP in Korea and give a big applause on your great success of this conference. To my knowledge, TCTAP originated from the Angioplasty Summit in 1995. Since then, uh, many cardiovascular doctors and researchers, not only in Korea, but also in the whole Asia-Pacific region, have discussed breakthroughs and new discoveries in their own fields through this conference. Unfortunately, from 2020 to 2022, the conference could only be held online due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, even in those difficulties, more than 7,000 people from 87 countries participated online last year. It shows that TCAP is indeed one of the most prestigious cardiovascular conferences in the world. We finally overcame COVID-19 and are able to meet face to face this year. So I expect even more contributions from our cardiovascular scientists than before for this year's meeting. I hope TCAP continues its success and provides many more opportunities for cardiovascular doctors and researchers, not only in the Asia Pacific area, but all across the whole world to learn and enjoy the presence of fellow colleagues. I appreciate for the effort of the committee to prepare this wonderful meeting, especially Professor Sung Jung Park and Professor Doug Park, and I hope this year's TCAP will be a memorable one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teta Stutz, for congratulatory speech. Uh, Dr. Um, Sung Woo Park, uh, for your work uh, for the Academy Progress of Heart Specialist. Thank you once again. Um, yes, uh, this year has been thoroughly prepared for everyone to be able to share the fundamentals to their latest research trends uh, through workshops. So on that note, uh, before starting our keynote speeches and lectures, uh, please allow us to give an introduction on this uh, TCT AP 2023. Uh, Dr. Tok Upak will give us the brief overview of TCT AP 2023 program highlights. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you, the S.J. Park and Sungu Park, and I'm D.W. Park, the same family name, not real family. So I'm going to brief overview this year TCTAP 2023 program highlight, get together again, TCTAP 2023. You know, new challenging virtual meeting last three year COVID-19 era. However, we don't give up academic work. We have a very nice virtual meeting, 2020, 2021, last year, 2022, more than 3,000 participants in the world joined our virtual meeting. This year, we start new again, our classic TCTAP meeting. We also combined the virtual format. So key figure in TCTAP 2023, more than 4,000 participants from 60 countries, 459 world-renowned invited faculty joined our meeting again. We prepared more than 350 lectures, 31 abstract, 28 live cases from nine live south in the world, Canada, US, China, and Japan. The program overview, our program comforts the four-day session, and the last day we have a very wonderful TCTAP workshop session. Also, we prepared a very interesting and challenging live case session. Three days is a left main, complex PCI, TABOR, tear, and peripheral intervention. Also, interesting and hard CTO intervention. The last day we have a very educational program highlight, left main, evolution of the valve intervention, evolution of imaging and physiology, all about tips and treat, complex PCI. 
So, and the day two today is the main session. We will have a very highlighted program, joint session with the TCT key member. And two and three days, we have a very diverse program, MedTech innovation, complex PCI, Tower versus server, and vulnerable plug and imaging physiology, all about new data, antithrombotic, complex PCI, as well as peripheral intervention. Also, we have day three program highlight all about new data from Assam Medical Center and future ongoing trial. Also, last and this year in Asian Pacific area, we published the four New England Journal of Medicine late breaking trial in 2023 in Asian Pacific area and best clinical trial from abstract. Last day, we do very challenging case competition. We have KCTA symposium session and absolutely our TCTAP is joined with the International Society 12 from 10 country, including TCT, Sky, CCT, Tokyo Valve, and EBC Club. So last day, and uh, we have uh, rounding four days at a very nice satellite symposium, including the expert meeting in breakfast, also lunch activity. We have also very special, very honorable activity, TCT AP Award will be soon. And uh, the last year, Ellen Young was awarded, and this year, somebody sit here. And uh, finally, TCTAP, our social media ambassador, always stand by 24 hour. Let's stay tuned in our TCTAP via several social media. Thank you for joining TCTAP. Everyone, hope you enjoy Asian Pacific Educational Hub TCTAP 2023. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul, for giving us the overview of TCTAP 2023. Yes, uh, there are multiple sessions and events uh, prepared until the 9th, so I hope you have insight for enjoying the time during your stay in Korea. And now, uh, let us start our lecture in earnest. So, first of all, we'll have the first keynote speech, keynote lecture by uh, Dr. Nico Pizzo. So, please uh, join me in welcoming him with a big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a special honor for me to have this opportunity to give this keynote lecture about 30 years of FFR. And as a matter, these are my potential conflict, conflicts of interest. As a matter of fact, we have to start with Andreas Grunzig, who already measured pressures all the time. But he recognized the value of the pressure measurements, but was hampered by three limitations. He had no reliable device to measure, he had no hyperemic stimuli, and FFR had not been invented yet. In the mid and late 80s, there was a discovery of reliable and safe maximum hyperemic stimuli. In the early 90s, prototypes of pressure wires were developed and the fractional flow reserve was introduced by Bernardo Bruyne and myself. What means FFR? FFR is in fact based upon the two following principles. First, it is not resting the flow, the maximum achievable flow, which determines the functional capacity of the patient. Hyperemia is the wind tunnel for the coronary artery stenosis. And second, at maximum vasodilation, blood flow to the myocardium is proportional to myocardial perfusion pressure. To see it in the schedule, in the upper part of the slide, you see a normal coronary artery with the myocardium, and the lower part there is a stenosis. If at hyperemia, the gradient across that stenosis is 30 millimeter mercury, that doesn't tell us so much. If we like to understand the effect of the stenosis on the myocardium, we have to realize that the perfusion pressure has fallen to 70 millimeter mercury, whereas it should be 100 without the lesion. And that means, because of the linearity between P and Q at hyperemia, that maximum achievable blood flow to the myocardium in the lower part is only 70% of what it should be in a normal case. And that is exactly what we call FFR. 
the very fraction of normal maximum blood flow, which is still maintained despite the presence of the stenosis. So simply, F of R as PD divided by PA, both measured at maximum hyperemia. How should we validate that concept 30 years ago? The first problem was that we didn't have a pressure, measure, a pressure measuring wire for reliable intracoronary pressure measurements. Such wire did not exist, and therefore we had to make it ourselves. And this is the first pressure wire we made. It is consisted of the third, last 30 centimeters of a balloon over the wire, which was made at that time by ACS, because it was sometimes difficult to cross a lesion with a balloon in the early 90s. And we stripped the balloon, and we took the last 30 centimeters of the wire, which was hollow, and we glued that to a small infusion catheter with a diameter of 2.8 French. And when we did the measurements, that infusion catheter was within the guiding catheter and didn't influence the hemodynamics, and only that wire part was into the coronary artery. We glued that by Bison kit, which is a Dutch trademark of kit, and with that device, we were able to measure nice phasic coronary pressures, both at rest and at hyperemia, as you can see here. And with that wire, we did the first animal experiments. You see here myself and Bernard de Bruyne. We put an occluder and an electromagnetic flow meter around the coronary artery, and we validated that FFR as truly calculated by the flows equaled FFR as measured by the pressures. And you see that this was a remarkable, uh, unsurpassed, nice correlation between the both. And we wrote in circulation in 1993 a paper. In that paper, we introduced the term fractional flow reserve, so that can be considered as the birth of FFR. From 1997 on, reliable pressure wires became available for routine use in humans, and clinical research in coronary physiology got a large impetus. Presently, there are six different types of pressure wires mentioned on the left, all good wires, and all have their interfaces. Some of them are brand-specific, others are generic, like the Coroventus system that is shown here, and which enables us not only to measure the pressures, but also the temperature in the distal coronary artery. This is just a simple example. A gentleman, a 70% lesion in the proximal LED. To understand the effect of that lesion, we first measure the pressure at rest, but that doesn't tell us so much. Then we start hyperemia, the exercise, the wind tunnel, and you see that the distal pressure goes down to 52. Proximal pressure is 109, so FFR is 0.47, which simply means that due to that stenosis in the proximal LED, the perfusion, the maximum perfusion of the anterior ball, is decreased to 47% of what it should be under normal circumstances. We validated at that time in eight healthy volunteers and 33 normal coronary arteries that in all arteries under normal circumstances, FFR is indeed one, an unequivocal normal value of one. In contrast to patients who had apparently contralateral disease, there sometimes you find lower values. The reproducibility of FFR was tested in numerous studies. This is just one of them, and it is excellent. And in fact, there is not any index in physiology or in clinical medicine in general which is so reproducible as FFR. And because we have one unequivocal normal value of one for every artery, every patient, every hemodynamic condition, and because there is such a high reproducibility, it is to be expected that there is also a sharp cutoff between pathologic and non-pathological values. We validate that in a very special way, using a so-called prospective multi-testing by using approach. We published that in the New England Journal in 1996, and we could prove that if FFR is less than 0.75, there is always a significant stenosis, whereas if FFR is above 0.80, in 95% certainty, there is no ischemia. There is one other very special feature of FFR, maybe you have not realized. FFR is in fact the link between stenosis severity, maximum blood flow, perfusion territory, and myocardial ischemia. To understand that, have a look at this slide I got from a doctor from Bachrein. You have a hose, a water hose, and you have a garden. You sprinkle the garden, and you are wondering if the hose has a diameter that is large enough to keep your garden wet. You will ask, of course, that is your first question, is your garden like this or like that? Well, that's the same as FFR. 
if you have two situations with two completely equal epicardial coronary arteries, the same cross-sectional area, the same IVUS, the same OCT, the same QCA, exactly the similar, but the myocardial extender is different. One is normal, one had a partial myocardial infarction. Then, of course, the functional significance of these lesions is different. And the only way to find that out is FFR, because in the upper case, FFR is 0.60. In the lower case, it is 0.80. That is a unique feature of fractional flow reserve. FFR has been validated in almost all clinical and angiographic conditions, extensive studies, and we already have the hyperemic pullback recording since 20 years, which is a practical guide to determine where exactly stents should be placed and to evaluate its results. The resting pullback can be used for the serial stenosis. And recently, all these pullbacks were refined and more sophisticated by the PPG index introduced by Carlos Collette and his co-workers. What about FFR and clinical outcome? There are numerous data about that. This is a famous study showing that after one, two, and five years, if you do FFR-guided PCI and multivessel disease, outcome is 30% better for every type of event compared to angio-guided PCI, not only for MACE, but also for desert MI. This is the FAME2 study. Their patients with multivessel disease had FFR in all lesions. Some of these patients had no ischemia. All lesions were FFR negative. That is the green line. Beautiful outcome after two years. Other lesions with the same anatomy, all patients had at least one lesion which was FFR positive and they were treated medically by randomization. There is a red line. So having ischemia is much worse than having no ischemia, even if anatomy is the same. And then the third group of patients were the patients who had at least one lesion which was everywhere positive, but had PCI. That is the blue line. And there are two things. First, it shows us the benefit of ever guided PCI. And secondly, it shows to us that if you do a good PCI, that we reduce the risk of the patient to the risk of normal. Finally, the FAME 3 study, with the purpose to show that uh, everywhere guided PCI and 3 vessel disease was not inferior to cabbage. We could not prove that. That is on the right-hand side. But we compared it with the syntax done 10 years earlier and without everywhere guidance. And then you see that in the FAME 3 study, the result of everywhere guided PCI and complex multivessel disease was twice as good as in the angio-guided syntax study. Unfortunately, also the surgeons did a very good job, or I should say fortunately for the patients, and also cabbage had much better results, so still there was a difference. But the absolute numbers are impressive. Also in Korea and in many other studies, a lot of work has been done, especially the registry has learned us a lot. What is the spin-off of FFR and future perspectives? We have seen the development of resting in the chest. No hyperemia is mandatory, that is an advantage, but more often false negatives are observed. That is especially the case if you have focal lesions and large coronary arteries, mostly in the proximal part and in young patients. If you have such a patient and a minimal resting gradient, be aware you need hyperemia to show that the lesion is significant. Other spin-off is IMR, index of microvascular resistance for the microcirculation. Then angio-derived FFR, still in the children's shoes. And FFR by CT, which is truly non-invasive and well-validated and had positive clinical outcome data, also in terms of triage and cost efficiency. And more recently, a new paradigm developed, and that is really important. We could measure absolute flow and microvascular resistance in milliliter per minute and wood units, both at rest and hyperemia, in a very, very stable and reproducible way. That also gives the possibility to calculate absolute CFR and even more importantly, MRR, which is microvascular resistance reserve, a kind of super FFR for the microvasculature, and that is the new standard for quantifying microvascular disease. Tomorrow in the afternoon, there is a symposium opening the black box of the microcirculation. I could advise you to go there if you really learn to so, need to learn something new. Here at this meeting, you should go to that symposium. So my take-home messages, anatomy alone is insufficient to understand physiology. FFR and derived NHS provide superior insights into coronary pathophysiology and greatly improve the correct diagnosis. And there is incontrovertible evidence for improved outcome of coronary disease and revascularization by the dedicated use of FFR.
This is the Katharina Hospital. I'm working here for 30 years. We do 1,600 FFR cases per year. It is still a pleasure to measure pressure. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nico Pizzo, for sharing with us your experience and some ideas through the lecture. Thank you very much once again. And our second keynote lecture will be by Dr. Martin Bert Leon, but unfortunately, he's not be able to be with us today, but he sent us the video message for his lecture. Let us look at the video clip. Dear colleagues and friends, it's my honor to give this keynote lecture entitled Contemporary Trends in Aortic Stenosis Management for the audience and participants of the 28th TCT Asia Pacific. These are my conflicts. When we think of contemporary aortic stenosis, we really should think of this as a, a life journey disease. We tend as interventionalists to focus on the index procedure itself, enhancing technology, expanding indications. But importantly, prior to the index procedure, there is a component of what we've called upstream development for this therapy. Similarly, we believe that after the index procedure, there are many other considerations that need to be understood when we consider the patient's lifelong journey. Upstream, before the index procedure, are new ways to diagnose aortic stenosis. This is an example of an ECG-developed algorithm using machine learning to be able to diagnose significant left-sided heart disease. This was initially developed in South Korea, then the Mayo Clinic, and now Columbia University has also developed similar algorithm, algorithms for enhanced detection and diagnosis of valvular heart disease. As you can see here, using artificial intelligence, machine learning with 12 lead ECGs, with high sensitivity and specificity, we can begin to diagnose those patients that seem to have significant left-sided aortic valve disease, either aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, or mitral regurgitation. Machine learning is also used as a framework to identify distinct phenotypes of aortic stenosis severity to prioritize procedures, as shown in this elegant work done by Parthar Sengupta. These diagnostic techniques are important for the better upstream understanding of the diagnosis of aortic stenosis in the population. But we also believe that upstream thinking requires an understanding that our previous traditional notions of, a, uh, of aortic stenosis should be modernized and should be altered. In this Heart Valve Society 50th anniversary of the original publication of the Natural History of Aortic Stenosis by Ross and Brownwald, we spoke to Dr. Brownwald about what he thought was an important development in our understanding of aortic stenosis. And he cited the staging classification manuscript that includes the extent of cardiac damage in a better understanding of AS severity. This means that echocardiograms in a large number of patients and patients with severe aortic stenosis could be divided into various stages of cardiac damage, uh, indicating first uh, increase in LV mass, left atrial volumes, mitral regurgitation, diastolic dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, and then right-sided disease. Interestingly, in these patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, 85% had stage two or greater cardiac damage at the time of their index procedures. Importantly, the baseline cardiac damage strongly predicted one year mortality after AVR as shown here. And after AVR, Irrespective of the magnitude of baseline cardiac damage, the majority of patients 
had no change or worsening cardiac damage a year later. And the one-year changes in cardiac damage after the index procedure importantly predicted two-year mortality or heart failure hospitalization, leading to the hypothesis that in severe AS, waiting for symptoms as the main trigger for aortic valve replacement results in more cardiac damage, which is not reversible in most patients after AVR and predicts long-term adverse clinical outcomes. So this concept of upstream AS treatment suggests that our understanding of aortic stenosis uh, in the past really has been misunderstood. And we asked the question, at what AS severity do, do adverse events occur? and recognize now that there is wide patient variability in AS pressure load tolerance and the expression of adverse events. This leads to this conceptual framework of upstream AS treatment, acknowledging that this is a chronic disease, earlier management and follow-up are necessary, delaying progression is an aspirational goal, and clinical research should shift from late-stage reactive AVR to early stage preemptive AVR and other complementary therapy approaches. We are seeing this now represented in a variety of new studies. This preemptive AVR approach in asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, including surgical trials and transcatheter studies, like the EVOLVE trial that is completed enrollment, looking at at risk features in severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis either biomarkers or looking at CMR, mid-wall changes indicating fibrosis, or the early TAVR trial, which is a uh, important large study in asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis with treadmill demonstrated absence of symptoms randomizing to early transfemoral TAVR versus clinical surveillance, which is completed enrollment. Similarly, we're learning that moderate aortic stenosis has many at-risk features as well, and there are three clinical trials, one that is completely enrolled, the UNLOAD trial, and two trials that are ongoing now. One is the PROGRESS trial, and the other the EXPAND TAVR2 study. And importantly, these are patients with only moderate aortic stenosis looking at at-risk predictors that are randomized to clinical surveillance versus earlier or preemptive TAVR. And these are some of the features that are represented as at-risk predictors, including symptoms, LV function, atrial fibrillation, other echo parameters, rapid progression, elevated biomarkers, and elevated calcium scores. So now we can begin to characterize the totality of issues relating to aortic stenosis in a broad spectrum of patients, integrating on the vertical axis hemodynamic severity at the valve lesion level, and on the horizontal axis, the stage of disease progression or cardiac damage. We can see that in green, aortic valve replacement has only been validated for a small subset of all of the AS patients. The clinical trials that we've been just discussing will allow us to have more information about beginning to treat patients with milder disease of degree, uh, um, milder degrees of aortic stenosis and fewer symptoms. Now, after the index procedure, we are also concerned about downstream considerations, in particular, AV valve durability and also adjunctive pharmacotherapy. Early data suggests that right now, these bioprosthetic valves that have been implanted um, have reasonably good structural valve deterioration and bioprosthetic valve failure when studied at between five and eight years for both the balloon expandable and the self-expanding devices. But we will be seeing patients that certainly have evidence of failed TAVR valves and new technologies are required, many of which involve material science innovation. The first is the Edwards Resilia valve, which is an interesting version using Resilia tissue, which has stable capping of the free aldehyde 
portions uh, um, of the leaflet material with glycerization allowing dry leaflet storage. There are a total of seven formulations of this new tissue that are being applied in surgical and transcatheter Edwards valves. The Enteris Duravr system with acellular detoxified uh, tissue, which uh, tends to reduce calcification with a single piece construction and excellent hemodynamics is another version of a new, completely different form of transcatheter aortic valve, which is in early feasibility studies. And similarly, the Foldax tria valves use true polymer leaflets with a siloxane polyurethane elastomer for both surgical aortic and mitral valves and a transcatheter valve in development, all of which is manufactured using robotic techniques. And finally, although we understand the pathophysiology of aortic stenosis, there are no known proven medical therapies to slow or prevent the progression of calcific AS. And for many reasons, we believe that these trials have been delayed, but are now beginning to resurface with many new potential therapeutic targets and exciting new clinical trial methodologies. We've also learned that there may be ways to apply medical therapies to help manage the patient during the pre-treatment and post-treatment phases, recognizing that residual risk from heart failure is due to cardiac remodeling and irreversible injury associated with cardiac damage. So we believe that there may be an opportunity to intercede in these patients with adjunctive therapy to protect the heart during progressive AS and to augment its recovery after AVR. And these are common clinical trial processes using drugs that are readily available, including RAS inhibition, uh, Entresto, SGLT2 inhibitors. So we expect there to be a new era of pharmacotherapy for aortic stenosis, applying many new techniques such as adaptive randomization, real-time Bayesian analysis, using continuous data monitoring and common control therapies, as well as surrogate imaging endpoints to accelerate our understanding if drugs are working or not working. So we think the pharmacotherapy era for AS is just beginning. So if we redraw this grid that represents the uh, life history of aortic stenosis, as mentioned, multidrug precision medical therapy will be an important component of the early stage of treatment, as well as adjunctive during later stages, incorporated with some of the other more traditional aortic valve replacement technologies appropriately applied preemptively when indicated based upon clinical trial data, which is now being generated. So I've tried to suggest to you that it's a complex area to look at the lifelong journey of aortic stenosis, the earlier diagnosis, preemptive treatment in appropriate patients, optimizing the index procedure, and then managing issues such as valve durability and incorporating or integrating pharmacotherapy approaches to manage patients at various stages of the disease. Thank you very much. Yes, a sincere thank you to Dr. Leung for sharing his various knowledge and information with his lecture. And we'll just uh, hope we will see him uh, next year in person. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, today we have something special set aside for everyone, which is the TCTAP Award Session. Masters of the Masters. Yes, this is a word granted to thank and show our respects to those who made a big contributions in the field of cardiology and devoted their all for humanity's health, who's been selected for the Masters Masters. Co-chairperson Dr. Sung Jong Park will be announcing it to us. So let us see him just once again to the podium. So would you please Give us your presentation. Okay. 
Once again, uh, I heartily welcome you all to the 13th TCTAP Master of Masters Award uh, Ceremony 2023. As a host of this annual meeting, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to reward this very prestigious award today. Okay, I will uh, check this one. Uh, since 2011, the TCTAP Master Master's Award was given with him acknowledged the achievement of a distinguished expert who have made a phenomenal contribution to the development of in, in the field of intervention cardiology and to the growth of a TCT AP as well. <clears throat> On behalf of all the cardiologists, and the TCTAP committees, I would like to extend sincere appreciation to our past 12 masters for their hard work and dedication. Also, uh, we are finally uh, back to the uh, offline meetings. Please let me uh, ex extend uh, special thanks to Anna, our masters, Greg Stone, Renu Bomani, and Alan Young again, who have received this award from our virtual meeting in 2020, 2021, 22. And now, uh, I would like to uh, proudly present the winner of the 13th TCCAP Master Master's Award. Please. The master was born in Paris on January 25, 1945, and graduated high school at Lycée Charlemagne in 1960. Being a boy who loved playing the piano, he hesitated to become a pianist or a doctor when he was 18. The birth of an irrevocable vocation for medicine has begun with the fascination of early diligent readings of countless books about medicine. Choosing to pursue his academic career in medicine, the master graduated the University of Paris and completed residency and internship in France and fellowship at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles, California. Moving back to Rouen in 1977, the master joined Charles Nicole Hospital as a full-staff cardiologist, and now he has been leading the field since joining the department for more than 20 years. Dr. Cripier is a revolutionary cardiologist, widely known for performing the first transcatheter implantation of aortic valves procedure in the world. He has received numerous prestigious awards and scientific distinctions globally in recognition of his innovative pioneering works. This is a very prestigious award, and I cannot think of anyone better who deserves this award for what he's done for the field of transaortic valve replacement. You have been an inspiration for all of us, a leader of the field, and we all owe you so much. Without you, the field of TAVA wouldn't be where it is today. I've learned that this award symbolizes that individual who brings creativity, discovery, innovation into the craft of interventional cardiology. There is simply no one who better symbolizes that ideal than Alain Cribier, who was the initial test pilot, pioneer of transcatheter valve therapies that has led to the dissemination of an entirely new subspecialty. Honestly, I can think of no one who's made a larger contribution to interventional cardiology over the past 20 years. Through your pioneering work on the development of transcatheter aortic valve replacement, you have added both years to life and life to years for so many of our older patients with severe aortic stenosis. And through this, you have ushered in a new era of structural cardiology, which has only just begun. Since 1985, Dr. Cribier's long journey in developing technological innovations for acquired valve disease has begun with his dream team of interventional cardiologists and surgeons in Rouen. Finally, after more than 10 years of research, the first transcatheter aortic valve implantation has been implemented by Dr. Alan Cribier on April 16, 2002. 
which is a remarkable and breakthrough point in the history of interventional cardiology. Dr. Cribier has opened up a new door that this innovative technology now saved up to millions of patients in more than 80 countries worldwide today. I know you since the mid-80s when you performed the first case of balloon aortic valvuloplasty, and it was really a revolution. Everybody knows the last, uh, the last part of the story and how much time was needed to move from the film in 2002 to low-risk patients uh, today. Thanks to your great clairvoyance and strong perseverance, about 50% of patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis are now treated with uh, TAVI. Incredible to see how much the entire professional world recognize how major your contribution was for the patient care. We were lucky in Massy, together with Thierry Lefebvre and the team, to be the second TAVI center in France to be opened, just after Rouen. Hello. I was very happy to hear you getting this award. Uh, I remember coming and visit you, visiting you and you had your, your Legion d'honneur um, uh, investiture uh, in Rouen, and that was really quite thrilling. And then. Uh, it's just come such a tremendously long way. And you deserve tremendous credit for this. In 2012, he received the Legion of Honor investiture from the hands of Professor Alan Carpentier, the great founder of modern surgical techniques in aortic valve and mitral valve disease. A celebration of the 20th anniversary of TAVI was held in Rouen 2022, and his hard work and achievements were commemorated by his colleagues and friends from the whole world. Alan, you are an icon in interventional cardiology. You made uh, structural interventions uh, a reality. You saved uh, so many lives. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to say a few words uh, and to express my congratulations. Alan, you are truly, truly an inspiration for multiple generations of interventional cardiology. And you've been a friend for years. I mean, I still remember the time in Rouen, 1987, when I came to learn balloon aortic valvuloplasty from you. How I sent my fellows to you for training, how you've actually been a friend for India and the Indian interventional cardiologists, and of course, a real bonding and a friend of mine. Dr. Alan Cribier has been attending TCTAP for more than 15 years, and his contribution and dedication to the meetings always has been an inspiration to attendees from all around the world. Hi, Alan. I'd like to send you sincere congratulations on visiting the 13th TCTAP Master of Masters Award. Well, what I want to say could be explained in this one sentence. Thank you for being the father of the tablets. Through your collective effort and spirit as a pathfinders, most cardiologists must have truly been motivated and benefited greatly from your expertise. Moreover, you are not only an instructor, researcher, and a mentor, but we love and highly respect you for your warm heart for being a good friend. The entire Root World team congratulates Alain Crigier for his prestigious award, which crowns his career and his major innovations in cardiology. We are in the room where the first study in the world was performed. Alain Crigier is known for his human qualities, his humor, his technical excellence, his passion, and his sense of innovation. For us, Alain is a genius for smart cardiology. Dr. Alan Cribier recently created the Rouen Medical Training Center for the education of future leaders in the field of cardiovascular medicine. Teaching his own tips and techniques at the new training center, his lifelong dedication and contributions to this field will continue with his never-ending passion. Congratulations, the master of masters this year, Dr. Alan Crivier. Please welcome him with a big round of applause to the stage. Please come up to the stage. We need a thunderous round of applause once again. Please come up to the stage. And also, we'd like to invite the Professor Park again to the stage to present the flag. Congratulations.
congratulations. He devoted his whole life to saving the lives of patients. And the uh, Dr. Sung Jung Park will present as a special plaque to the winner of 13th Master's Masters, Dr. Alan Kribier. Congratulations. Yes, of course, we needed to take a commemorative photograph to record this precious moment. And we'd like to invite the two of you, honor two of you, to the center of the stage. Congratulations, and also warmly bless their long friendship. Thank you. And also, we can't miss the special lecture from Dr. Alain Cribier. So, would you please share with us your feelings first, the doctor? Well, to tell you the truth, I am a little moved here. It's <laughs> difficult to talk. I would like to say how much uh, grateful I am for receiving this award. You know, uh, I have so uh, commitment. So I, I have been so close of you, my friend uh, Singung, you know, for many years. And uh, receiving this award from your hands has a very special meaning to me. So it's a great day. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been asked to uh, try to recap a little of this uh, 20 years of love story with uh, TVR, and uh, I will do that with uh, a great pleasure. This is my uh, disclosure. <clears throat> Actually, you know that French people are supposed to be great lovers, so one love story is not enough. So actually. Uh, uh, in the field of acquired valve disease, disease, I had uh, three successive love stories. So the first one was with the balloon aortic valvuloplasty, and uh, I uh, started uh, this uh, new technology uh, in '85, and uh, with the first publication in the Lancet in in '86. Then I got uh, I fell in love with uh, mitral stenosis, and uh, I did. Uh, I developed a mitral commissurotome, which was very much used in developing countries because this device was able to be reduced uh, up to 100 times. So the cost of the, of the procedure was absolutely dropping. But the biggest love story was obviously with the development of transcatheter aortic valve, TAVR. Actually, we say in France, in Europe, TAVI, because TAVI, T-A-V-I, Transcatheter valve implantations mean also TAVI, my life. So I, I find that this anagram was extremely, extremely tough, you know, so we said TAVI. And uh, this was a big love story, but it was a little more problematic, especially to start. And uh, uh, if I was able to do that, as you have seen on the slides, you know, it's because I was uh, working in an exceptional dream team uh, with a rare partnership especially between interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. And uh, not to say a word about nurses and technicians, you know, they all shared my love stories and helped making my dreams come true. So you can see on the screen here, uh, Professor Bessou, who was the head of uh, cardiac surgery in the 90s, and uh, Professor Elena Chaninov, you have seen her on the la last video, uh, who has been my uh, right arm for the development of this technology, and who is now chief of the Department of Cardiology after me. And you can see also Christophe Tron, who was associated in the first case. So since 85, uh, actually I had two successive love stories with degenerative aortic stenosis, balloon valvuloplasty and transcatheter aortic valve implantation. But actually it was the same kind of research program. The two innovations were absolutely linked. It was to provide a life-saving therapeutic option for a number of patients with symptomatic aortic stenosis who were declined for surgical valve replacement. And we know that in the 2000s, 
almost more than one third of the patients were not operated on, and the mortality rate for those patients was as high as 80% at three years. But when I started being involved with degenerative aortic stenosis, the mortality rate was much higher because 50% of the patients were declined for surgery just because age per se above 70 years of age uh, was a usual contraindication to surgery. So my goal was to uh, attempt to solve a major unmet clinical need. So in uh, 85, you know, uh, my first love story started uh, beautifully with a 72-year-old woman who was very highly symptomatic. Actually, she couldn't move. She was fainting. She, was, uh, she had loss of consciousness for every movement. She stayed in bed for two months. She also had coronary artery disease, and she had been turned down for surgery three times. So for these patients, I decided to try dilating the valve uh, with a balloon catheter, and uh, it was a kind of miracle because I used a small-sized balloon, but the symptom relieved immediately, and I started to do a first series of patients in uh, those patients who had been uh, turned down for surgery, and the first series was published in The Lancet, and it was a real first bomb blast in the medical community. In 85, we started to do uh, seminars, and it was the first of hundreds of seminars and workshops in Rouen. And uh, amazingly, you know, uh, our team was suddenly recognized by the whole medical community. And you have seen the slides, you know, presented by uh, Jacques Set, but uh, we had uh, suddenly the, the most famous cardiologist coming to want to learn this technology. And I started, you know, taking my uh, root sack and uh, uh, going uh, around the world, you know, to train people everywhere on every week basis. So this technique was fiercely criticized by the cardiac surgeons, but expanded all over the world. So there was a, a glorious period and a breakup. You know, tens of thousands of patients were treated in the world. We had more than 1,200 articles and registries on balloon aortic valvuloplasty, and the FDA approved uh, uh, in 92 uh, balloon aortic valvuloplasty in uh, restricted indications. I created uh, the, the BAV balloon catheter that you can see here. So there was this expansion, then a disillusion because of non-lasting results due to early valve restenosis. So it was a broken heart. So what to do next? You know, when you have a failure like this, you can give give up or you can fight. And uh, I decided to fight, and this uh, uh, was the first move to the transcretaire aortic valve. But there is always something left after a first love story. You know, for, at the present time, you know, balloon aortic valvuloplasty is still performed in some selected cases. It, has been, it is a very simplified uh, procedure with a very short hospitalization stay. But also the uh, collateral effect was to develop rapid ventricular pacing for stabilizing the balloon during balloon aortic valvuloplasty. And without rapid ventricular pacing, we won't have been able to implant the balloon expandable valve. So this is something good. And also, and I am very proud of that, 40 years later, you know, balloon aortic valvuloplasty remains part of daily TAVR procedures, as you know, for pre-dilating, post-dilating, or doing balloon sizing, for example. And it means that this technique definitely survived, so it's not that a big failure. So uh, between 90 and 99, uh, the, I, I have been knowing nine really painful years. You know, I, I came in 90 with the, uh, the, the concept implanting a valve prosthesis within the, the diseased calcific native valve on the beating heart using percutaneous catheter-based technique and local anesthesia. And I said local anesthesia because general anesthesia was one of the main factors to cancel to, to turn down surgery because the anesthesiologist said that the patients won't survive. So I presented this uh, concept uh, many times, everywhere, and there was a, an unanimous opinion of experts, cardiac surgeons, saying that it was both impossible and dangerous. 
ridiculous to think inserting an artificial valve within such massive calcifications without removing the native valve first, and also extremely dangerous because of the adjoining structures, coronary artery ostia, mitral valve, is mandal, going to uh, create a number of potential lethal complications and device embolization, and so on. So they said also that it was a most stupid concept and they advised the companies to forget about it. But we didn't give up. And uh, I just wanted with my team in Rouen uh, to check whether the surgeons were right when they said that it was impossible. So we did a landmark autopsy study with major consequences and we validated the intraventricular stenting. As you can see here, we had 15 patients who died of calcific aortic stenosis, and in all cases, it was possible to open a balloon expandable stent. I was using a palmas stent circularly, you know, uh, which was an excellent, great news because if we wanted to put a valve inside, we needed to have a full expansion of the stent. And these results, I, I just give you here a single example, but were confirmed later on, just before the first, life case, the first in man case by Renu Virmani. Uh, we did exactly the same, you know, in major calcified aortic stenosis, it was possible to uh, put this balloon expandable stent with a circular opening. So this was a great, great news. Also uh, in Rouen, uh, we uh, demonstrated that uh, if the length of the stent was only 17 millimeter, it was absolutely possible to implant the stent over the aortic valve without reaching the coronary arteries, the intraventricular septum with the his bundle, and the mitral valve insertion. So this was extraordinarily uh, positive. So I, stepped, I, uh, I started doing uh, drawings for uh, filing a European patent, and uh, this is the way I was conceiving the stent, the valve, which is not that far from what we are using today. Uh, I had in mind the tricuspid polymeric or tissue valve, and we made with uh, my surgeon in Rouen, uh, this model of valve corresponding to this drawing, just to check whether it was possible. And also we could uh, crimp the valve over a, a cribier balloon catheter, and the crimped diameter was not more than eight millimeter. It means that in the vast uh, majority of patients, it would be possible to implant the valve through the femoral artery retrograde, and this is what I had in mind. Having a prototype in hands was the next step, you know, and uh, uh, this was made possible because I was very lucky to meet in uh, 96 or 7, uh, this guy, Stan Rabinovich, who was an, in, an engineer from Johnson Johnson, he was working together with Stan Rowe, that you can see here. And at that time, Martin Leon was medical director of Johnson Johnson. So they spoke together, and I was very surprised to see that they were believing in this project. They were the first people believing in this project. So we created a startup called Percutaneous Valve Technologies. And we were also very lucky to find a partnership uh, with a small company in Israel uh, who uh, not only founded Percutaneous Valve Technology, but made the TV system uh, themselves. So this is what they, they made, you know, the PVT hard valve, uh, which looks like more or less uh, the Sapien 3 that we are using today. It was a tricuspid valve made of polymer, then horse pericardium, stainless steel stand, single diameter 23 millimeter, cream diameter of 8 millimeter going through a 24 French. And with this valve, we did a lot of things. First of all, they did an extensive in lab testing uh, uh, in Israel, and you can see here, you know, they could prove that this valve was working up to 2.5 million cycles. But with my colleague, Alain Elshaninov, we started in Paris a huge uh, preclinical uh, study 
on the sheep model, we implanted about 100 uh, valves uh, in the sheep in, at different sites on the pulmonary artery, the, the aorta. It was very difficult to implant the valve in the orthotopic position because of the anatomy of the sheep, which does not correspond to the anatomy of the human. You know, the coronary arteries are very close and so on. But we found a way to implant the valve in the descending aorta after creation of uh, controlled aortic insufficiency by partially destroying the native aortic valve. And with this model, you know, we could demonstrate that at five months uh, in 10 sheep, the, the valve was working perfectly well with absolutely no abnormalities. And this was absolutely requested for, uh, by the FDA for any val uh, heart valve implantation in human. So the love story become, became passionate uh, when we did the first in man case. You know, you know the story probably, but it was a very young patient in cardiogenic shock with 12% ejection fraction, severe bicuspid valve, uh, stenosis, multiple comorbidities, including lung cancer and chronic uh, pancreatitis, a floating thrombus in the left ventricle, no thermal access, failed transeptal balloon aortic valvuloplasty was performed, and TAV was done as a last resource option uh, using uh, this unplanned uh, transeptal approach. You can see here um, the, the gadwar going from the femoral vein exiting to the femoral artery, the valve in place, the atmosphere in the cath lab and the valve delivered with this kind of hemodynamic result. You have seen these pictures, but the patient uh, eight days later was resuscitated and we published that in circulation. And it was a second bomb blast within the medical community. And it was received by a stupefaction, enthusiasm, and incredibility and fury of cardiac surgeons. Him again is coming back. So then we, we were allowed to do a very first series of 38 patients on compassionate basis, but the worst case you can imagine, you know, all the patients were supposed to have a spontaneous life expectancy of two weeks. So uh, it was horrible, and uh, we had 75% of success. 50% uh, of these patients uh, survived up to 6-5 years with return to normal life. And then I, I get the intimate conviction that a revolution was underway. I just show you the patient number three, you know, dying patients, six months after, you know, one year later, she was able to travel to Washington to attend the TCT meeting, and it was absolutely unbelievable. Two years later, she was doing perfectly well, and six, five years later, she was again, with normal, normal valvular function. And I want also to stress to this case, because it was the first ever planned transfemoral retrograde approach, I was allowed to do that because she had an associated mitral stenosis and I couldn't do the transeptal approach. And you see here the very first vision of valve implanted retrogradely. And at five years, she was doing perfectly well with unchanged hemodynamic results. So I started believing that this technique had a future the first step of uh, uh, TAVR offshore with all these people, you know, it was a great emotional moment of sharing, some breathtaking results in spite of a technically difficult transeptal approach, and in 2005 we had a total number of patients of 100. I will be fast now because in 2004, uh, the valve was acquired by uh, Edwards Life Sciences, and there was some progresses, you know, with an, an, an additional uh, 26 millimeter size for the valve, the, the creation of the retroflex catheter, because the retrograde cases that I did before was without any delivery system. The work by John Webb, you know, on the retrograde approach, improvement, fast improvement of the delivery system, uh, leading to the possibility of doing this national, European, international registries and the, the partner US trial. And suddenly, you know, a growing interest of cardiac surgeons for TAVR, the devil entered in the war for the first transepical case in Leipzig with Michael Mack and uh, Frederick Moore, and the transepical approach offered an alternative to the to TAVI, and in such a way that uh, with these two approaches, almost all uh, TAVR candidates could be treated. 
So then my uh, love stories got stronger year after year. You know, the reason of success, continuous advanced technology, outstanding scientific evaluation. So we had many, many advanced technology. I cannot enter into detail, but the, the input of the uh, MSCT, you know, for selecting the patients, the valve size, and so on, the model of valve. The new, new TAVI system with the Medtronic core valve in the first place, we played such an important role in spreading the technique all over the world. New indications improvement of valve delivery system, multiple size, prevention of PVL, frame geometry, and so on. And this was leading to the fact that the simpler transformal approach became the default strategy. This was my initial dream, if you remember. Now it's done in 95% of cases, and the minimalist version of this uh, transformal approach has been pioneered by us since 2012 and contributes to the impressive democratization of TIVR. And you know the, the, the scientific evaluation was absolutely remarkable with thousands of patients entering in registry, match registries, and the, the successive randomized trial uh, with the Edwards valve and the metronic valve you know, in patients at decreasing surgical risk risk, which is very unusual in medicine. So no one could have predicted the incredi incredible growth of TAVR and expansion of indications. In 2019 was the apotheosis of TAVI. I was really much in love with the procedure at that time, you know, FD approved in, uh, for all patients, uh, low risk, uh, be, uh, above the age of 65. And today, uh, we are reaching a number of TAVR around uh, 2 million people, uh, patients performed the world in more than 80 countries. The the TAVI market, as you know, exceeds now the TV AVR market in many countries, including USA, and we are expecting a growth of more than 10% per year, according to the uh, uh, increase uh, uh, multiplied uh, indications. Just a look, in 2022, you know, in one single year, 200,000 patients were implanted in the world. So, I am personally... Uh, very happy and I must say proud of having dedicated many years of my professional life to this exceptional love story and will remain forever impregnated with the emotional charge of the first case which was to become a landmark event in medicine and the love story continues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations once again. We need another big round of applause to the Dr. Alan Crivier. Thank you. Yes, his very new efforts to give us your special lecture, his special lecture. Thank you very much once again and a water heartfelt moment. And thank you, uh, Dr. Seung Jung Bak as well, to prepare this such a wonderful a moment. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, it is time to wrap up all the programs of opening ceremony. But before we conclude, I want to personally thank all the heart specialists for helping keep our heart healthy and helping me realize that I have a heart beating inside me through the wonderful stage. Thank you very much. And I'm signing off now, but we prepared various programs and events for this year's meeting, include TCT partnership session right after. So I hope uh, you fully enjoyed during the rest of your day. Thank you very much. 감사합니다.